Hello everyone, any questions before we start? I guess you all have the solutions for homework too. Um, like if you have any questions about homework as well, I can answer. So otherwise today we are going to start using SQL queries with Python code and we will have some additional SQL examples as well. So uh, we will first start uh, about how you can execute SQL queries through Python and then we will have some uh, different SQL uh, queries and we are going to like use Python to, to do that. So let me open up the slides. Okay, so from this lab, so we, we have two more labs after this one. We are going to use Python and we are going to manage the SQL database through Python code. So you need to have some Python. Uh, so for the project, for implementation stage two and for the final demo, uh, you need Python on your computers. If there is some version of it installed on your computers, that's enough for you. <clears throat> Otherwise, if you are going to install it from scratch, uh, the easiest way, like one of the easiest is to use the Anaconda distribution. So there is the link for Anaconda distribution. And like uh, the first half of this slide set goes through the process of how to install Anaconda Python. But uh, I guess uh, most of you took the Python course before and you use Spider, for example, in, in that course, uh, that would be sufficient for this course. And <clears throat> we are going to use the SQL tree library to connect to the SQL database. So in this lab, we are going to also talk about that. So the first part is going through the setup process. You just go to the Anaconda website. Like if you are installing, you can uh, follow through these slides. Like it's a very basic install process. And when you download it, Anaconda Navigator actually contains several different uh, tools to use Python. For example, uh, Spider uh, can also be run from here, but uh, Using the Jupyter Notebook is more useful for the case of the labs. So I'm going to use the Jupyter Notebook and like some tutorials are also using most of the time the Jupyter Notebook. Uh, we both include the Jupyter Notebook files and the uh, .py extension, the, the basic Python files uh, for the downloads. So you, you can use both of them, either one of them. So the Anaconda Python, uh, sorry, the Jupyter Notebook is kind of like a web page where you can have multiple cells and within those cells you can have some Python code. So we are going to uh, actually look at an example now. So let me open up the uh, Jupyter Notebook. It is going to display the uh, Python code using your default explorer. So in my case this is the Chrome browser it opens with the Chrome browser and this is the folder or the root folder uh, of the Python. So I have some folders in it. I have some uh, Jupyter Notebook files as well. So the extension for Jupyter Notebook files is IPYMB. So this can be opened directly from here. In this case, I would like to create a new uh, Jupyter Notebook file, for example. To do that, I will go through new and I would like to use Python 3. I'm going to choose it and it will open it as a new tab on my browser. Browser. And remember, uh, in here, in Jupyter Notebook, we have cells. We can insert multiple cells. So this is the option to do that. I can insert a new cell, cell below the existing one, for example. And within a cell, for example, I can write Python code. I can say x equals 5 and then, for example, let's print x. And to run that cell, I can click on the run button or the hotkey is control enter on the keyboard. 
and the output of the cells are displayed just below those cells. So for example, in a different cell, I can go and call something B, maybe B equals two, and I can go and print B in some other cell. The useful thing is, so for example, let me insert another cell here. Since I defined B already, in a different cell as well, I can print B. So uh, Jupyter Notebook is useful for us because within those, within our examples, for example, I can first connect to a database in some cell and in some other cell I can uh, operate on it. So that's why it's useful. Otherwise, it's just using basic Python. You can go with any uh, different uh, tool to use Python. And if you look at the slides, there are some uh, example codes here. So for these examples, I'm going to open the notebook file that contains them. So in here, I have that. So with Jupyter Notebook, one useful thing is to define your functions in some cell, for example, in here. We are defining some function right in the first cell. And if you notice, the last output is also shown here. So the Jupyter Notebook file also stores the output. You can save the output as well. We can also, for example, go to top under kernel. We have the option to restart the kernel. So while this page is running, there is some kernel in the background and for example whenever I call some function I initialize some variables those are stored in my kernel and if I would like to get rid of them I need to restart the kernel so uh, in the first cell for example we are defining some function and in the second cell we are calling that function if I try to run the second cell first we get an error right because my function is not defined so I need to first run the definition of the function. So you also see the order of uh, execution next to the cell. So I first executed this, got an error. I then executed this. That's why it's showing two. And let me uh, execute the second cell again. Uh, the order becomes three this time. So the my function returns some values this time. So we are going to use the SQLet3 library and it is contained in uh, some recent versions of Python. So most likely you don't need to install any other library uh, because uh, the SQL literary library should be included in your Python distribution. To test it, you can like in one cell or in some Python codes, you just run the import and if you don't get any error messages, then that means that it is already installed uh, within your Python. So actually the exact version uh, was written here somewhere I guess let me check it so uh, for Python versions bigger than 2.5 it is already included otherwise you need to install some Python that's greater than 2.5 and it and if you installed uh, Anaconda recently it's like uh, the most recent version so what do we have with this library for example with this library, we are going to manage uh, SQLit databases. So if you recall, we also had SQLit Studio to create our database. The plan is like that. We would like to create our database visually in the SQLit Studio. But then we would like to make it an application, right? We want some other users uh, using our database. To do that, we are going to use Python code and uh, we need to somehow connect to that existing database. So the database file is going to, uh, in our case, sit in this uh, file with DB extension. But in some real life scenarios, the database is actually in some distant f server. And for example, on the application on our computer, we are going to connect that server and, uh, for example, insert some data to the database, etc. And then uh, we close the connection to that database at the end. So this is following such uh, usage with the SQL3 library. The first thing that we need to do is to connect to an existing database. And our database is going to be 
located in the same folder of this uh, Python code. So either we are opening the connection to an existing database. In that case, there should be some file called example to that to db in our root directory in our uh, for example in this folder we are in the main directory and our uh, lab for first example python code is located directly in this root folder so we also expect the database file to be in the same directory otherwise if it is not an existing database file it's going to create a new file so with sqlit3.connect we either connect to an existing database so we either import the database or if it doesn't exist in the root directory or the path you write there it is going to create a new file so just wanting to notice or be careful sometimes people forget to include their database and when they uh, call the connect function it creates a new database but within that new database there is no tables there is no entries so they would get error messages when they try to run some queries so uh, we get some pointer to the connection and after this stage we are only dealing with this cur cursor object so uh, cur dot execute is going to be uh, the function that we are going to mostly use so this is like uh, some uh, basic procedure we need to go through uh, each time we would like to connect to a database so you can uh, copy this code and use it in your projects and in other things as well so we uh, import the library we connect to the database we get the connection pointer and then we can call SQL queries for this database so you will see that in here we have the execute function so if you look at it execute function is going to receive a text we need to put some string in here and there are actually several ways of writing a string in Python so for example if you use three single quotation marks then you can input multiple lines of text that will be traded as a string so in here we are using that to write a create table as well so there is no example to that db in that folder we are actually creating a new database and in that database we can uh, create some new table for example this is the definition for a user table and then we can insert some data in there so we are using exactly the same query right it is the execute function sorry not the query it is the same function but we are giving different SQL queries to that function so for example in here we are inserting three different users to this user table and we need to give the correct values so in here while using Python code there could be like multiple things going wrong we can have some Python errors or on the other hand we can have some error in our queries so we will see some examples of it but most of the time we are actually calling the same function which is the execute function when we execute functions then we need to commit our changes so committing if you remember it was also in SQL Studio for example you create some definition for a table you operate on it uh, you create some uh, attributes etc and at the end you need to commit uh, the changes otherwise it is not saved in the database it is the same with uh, this Python code so if you would like to store your changes you have to commit if you don't commit it when you open that database uh, after uh, after closing this code uh, you will not see the changes you would not see any tables or any entries for example and we have also uh, projection queries right we would like to retrieve some data from our tables for that again we are using the same function which is the execute function but this time for select queries only when you get or retrieve some data it can be uh, it can be shown using a for loop for example so the execute function may or may not return a result based on your query so if it is an insert query it will not return anything but if it is an select query it will return the data and the data can have multiple rows in it right 
So you can define a function, it is going to return a set of results. So this will be a set of results. And we can go with an for loop over those set of results and print each row, for example. At the end, we need to also close the connection to our database. Uh, for example, if you are not closing the connection and trying to start a new connection multiple times, you may get uh, some error messages. So that's why we need to also close the connection. So let me run this cell. So I just run that cell. So you can see uh, the order become five there. And I see that my data is inserted to these tables. But if I try to run it again, I will get some error message saying that this time the user table already exists. So there is some problem with my query, uh, but it's an operational error. So the syntax is correct for SQL and for Python, but I'm trying to do something that is not uh, possible to do. The thing is, I'm trying to create an existing table. I'm trying to create a new table with the same name. So let me just get rid of this execute portion. And if I try to run it again, now I'm getting a different error saying unique constraint fail for user ID. So I'm also trying to insert the same data into the tables, right? Uh, and they have the same primary keys, which is not possible. The primary key of the user ID, the ID attributes should be unique. So if I would like to insert this data, I need to have some new primary keys defined for it. So if I change the IDs and run it again, I will see that for this selection statement, I list all the existing users in my user table. I'm also going to show one more thing here. So let's get rid of the, sorry, let's get rid of the connection commit uh, line. So I'm not committing the changes now. And let me change the ID so that I don't get any error messages there. So these are new possible users. I'm going to uh, execute these queries and then list, the, all, list all the users. So I'm going to run that code. I see that there are nine users now, but I did not commit my changes. So let me run it again. I can run it multiple times. So there is nothing wrong with inserting these three users. But the thing is, the changes are not stored. So if I go into some other cell, or if I delete this uh, insert queries, and if I run that, I will see that only the first six users are there. So for the other three users, whenever I insert them, I can get the results. I can get the results from the selection query. But whenever I close the connection, then I can no longer get those changes. So uh, that's one thing. For example, if you are experimenting on your database uh, for the project, then you may maybe you can omit the commit parts and test on the data try to call different queries and at the end when you like are going to upload it to Moodle you can like enable the commit uh, line so if you don't commit the changes are not occurred on the file but while operating while the connection is still there the changes can be seen so that's one thing to be careful so in here, this is like uh, from some other cell, we can connect to that database. But in here, we are trying to insert some user with ID4. Let me get rid of that. Uh, so these six users are still there uh, after uh, closing the connection. So, uh, like, okay, that cell was also to give an example for it. But this time, let's try to connect to a database that uh, that's like uh, not created in the Python code. So if you remember, we had our uh, lab three database, right? Right. So let me get this file. So this is also on the web page. So if you go to the labs homepage, uh, there is the SQL database for lab three, we are going to use that for uh, this lab as well. But I need to put it into the working directory here. So this is some code to show the tables of my database, which is going to be called lab three. 
but if I try to run it, I will see nothing because lob3.db does not exist in my folder yet. But because it doesn't exist yet, it is going to create a new empty database actually. So if I go to this home page and if I look here, I will see that there is this lob3.db file. It is created some seconds ago and it's actually empty file. So I'm going to actually delete this lab 3 uh, db file and I'm going to upload or put the new uh, or, or the file that we downloaded. So I'm going to delete that one. I downloaded the, the file, so lab 3db but it's not located in the correct position. Uh, while the Jupyter notebook is open, to put that file, I can go through this. So I can choose upload and then it's going to bring me a dialog and then I need to choose the file the lab3db I'm going to open that file so it shows it here I can rename it but I'm going to choose upload it's working on the same computer but the phrases are like upload, download etc because it's uh, operating through the internet browser so if I look at here now lab3db is here and it's actually uh, not an empty file and if you are using, for example, Spider, then you need to put it in the same folder as well. So now, SQL, uh, now for the connection, lab3.db is in the correct position. If I run this cell, what I'm doing is actually I'm selecting everything from a table called SQLlet underscore master. So there is actually one table for SQLlet databases that includes the definition of all the tables that you have. So for example, if I'm connecting to a database that I have no information about, then I can get the SQLlet master table, look at it, and I will get some information about this table. So I see that there is some table called user, and this is actually the create table statement for the user table. And for example, another table called company, and this is the information for that company table, the, the create table statement for that company table. So we are actually interested in the ones that are called table in this case. For example, if I need to uh, print all the companies, so what can I do? So I'm going to insert some new cell here. So instead of executing this query, what I would like to do, I would like to select, for example, the company name maybe and the company ID for example or let's just go with company name from the company table so this is the query that we need to do and you will see that the uh, companies are listed and they are actually listed as tuples right so if I print the whole row it may contain multiple attributes in it so for example if I'm projecting everything from the company table then this has three things in it but even if I project just one information it returns as a tuple so each of the entries are tuples so for example to get the first attribute I need to do some indexing here right so sorry uh, let me do it like this so let's set project everything uh, we have some multiple attributes in it and uh, to get the first entry I need to do some indexing there for the row for example let's get the uh, index number one these are the names of the companies so the slides are containing this information actually going through the process of like uh, creating some tables etc and then we have like our main uh, Jupyter notebook file for this lab which contains the examples and you can download them from these links in the slides this is also available on the web page as two different versions and let me actually open it so for this lab there is the Jupyter notebook file and or also the Python version of it and since in the Jupyter notebook file so let me get to that one 
So let's say uh, I downloaded this Jupyter Notebook file and to include it in my Jupyter Notebook, what I need to do is to again upload that file. So I'm going to upload and I'm going to choose that IPYMB file and I'm going to upload it to my working directory and in here then uh, I locate it and if I click on it, it will open uh, that Jupyter Notebook file. And in here, remember, uh, our code is within cells, right? So if it opens it, let's get it. So uh, we have some cells of code here. We are going to go through these examples, but there is also the basic Python file version, and this is converted automatically. Because of that, each cell is contained as some Python code, and then we have some comments uh, that indicates the passage to a different cell. So, for example, in here it says in the first cell, this is the code that we have. In the second cell, this is the code we have, etc. Because of that, uh, we do not expect to actually run this Python file uh, as a whole. So, if you are going to use the .py version, uh, just uh, copy or like enable portions of the code and then like uh, call them, run them separately. So that's just one detail to be careful about. So those PY uh, versions are not for uh, running directly. You need to like focus on uh, separate parts of the code and like, like individually run them. And that's called this uh, Python file also requires the lab3.db to exist in the same folder. So we need the database file in the same folder. So any questions or problems up to this point? So these are like uh, some steps that we need to go through all the time and you can just copy and paste those codes from the examples. And then you need to like think about the application, what you need to do, when you need to do, and we are going to have some examples for them now. But before that, uh, let's also uh, talk about this. In a Jupyter Notebook file, we can have some code cells and we can also have some uh, mark uh, or, or what was it called markdown okay we can have some code cells and we can have some markdown cells markdown cells are not for running code they are for giving some information uh, for the user of this code so for example if i insert a cell here it is automatically a code cell but if i go through cell and in cell type I can change it to a markdown cell and this time I can no longer run it but I can write some information if I hit control enter if I try to run it then it is going to show it as a static text here and uh, there are like some markdown options uh, to like give some styling to this text uh, and we are going to actually slightly talk about them in a different lab but if I want to delete a cell, I can choose that cell. I'm going to uh, edit. There is the option to delete a cell. So the first cell is actually a markdown cell that gives some information. So this first one, what do we do here? Let's look at it. Uh, we are connecting to our lab3 database. We have the connection cursor and we would like to uh, print the results of some query and that query is actually printing everything from the company table and then we have some insertion query we decided to use the triple single quotation version for a string but like uh, in here uh, this is also fine I can use uh, double quotation and have my query in between so most of the time these will be equivalent so I can use this version as well then what do we do we just print the results after uh, the execution of the insert query and in here if you notice we are not actually uh, committing our changes at the end we just close our connection and uh, this example is for you to see that like after insertion the new company is there Plutronics is there but our settings did not commit. Since we did not commit, let's say this is some other time that we are connecting to the same database and printing the companies. If I run this cell, I do not see the Plutronics there. 
what do I need to do after insertion? I need to commit the changes if it, I would like to store them. So in that, in this other cell, we are actually inserting some new companies and we are using some different versions of, uh, let's say, uh, execution. So for the execute function, we receive a text parameter. So that text parameter can be in this form using uh, triple single quotations. Then I can have multiple lines of text and it is going to be treated as a string. But if I'm using the single quotation, the thing is that if I go to a different line, then that's no longer a string. I need to, for example, combine them using append uh, operations, etc. and make the other portion a string as well. Uh, some other thing that we need is to pass some parameters to our SQL code. So in one part we have SQL code, it's a string, but on the application side, for example, uh, from Python command line, we can receive some input from the user. We receive the input from the user, then we would like to pass it to the database, to the SQL query. And to do that, there is actually uh, some special form of the execute function. So if you are inserting or if you are giving two parameters to the ex execute function, the first one is a string that contains your SQL code. And the second one is your parameters to replace the question marks in your string. So I either give one string to the execute function or the other possibility, I give some string Within that string, there will be some question marks and those question marks will be replaced by the values that I give in the second parameter of this function. And uh, because of the definition, we need to give them in the tuple format. Even if we have just one question mark to be replaced, this should be just one uh, uh, tuple containing one or more elements in it. So to make it a tuple in Python, we contain it in the parentheses. So for example, if it was like multiple values, we have comma sign in between. But if it is just one value, to say that this is a tuple, we need the last uh, comma in, in that position. So we can have multiple question marks in our query. For example, in the first one, we are inserting into the company table this values and those values the first one is a question mark the second one is a text because of this single quotation marks i know that this is a text the third one is a number the monthly payment of the company and notice that uh, following the same thing uh, if it's a text it should be in a single quotation if it's a number we can write it directly but if it's a date for example we need to contain it in single quotations and we need to use the year month and then the day format so those things we need to still be careful about them uh, since this is a tuple we can contain it in different variables so in this version we are actually inserting another company but this time uh, all these three attributes or the values of those attributes are given from uh, Python. So these are actually Python uh, variables and we make them into a tuple and we can also write it directly next to the uh, query. So this is also an option, but we may like contain them in some other variable as well. And then we can just pass that variable to our execute function. It is also possible to define some multiple uh, tuples and then we can call the execute many function. So these are like two different alternatives. Let's say I have 10 data, 10 new companies. I would like to execute the insert uh, query for those 10 companies. One option, I can like have 10 lines of code. So maybe this is the first row and then I will have like such 10 rows, the values will be different. So that's one option. Another option, I can define those multiple rows as a list. So this new company values 
is a list of tuples. So what is a tuple? Tuple is this one, right? Tuples are, uh, so uh, in Python, uh, we cannot alter the tuple, right? But lists is not like that. We can append some new attributes or some new data to a list, but tuples are different. Tuples are like uh, the size of a tuple is strict, right? Uh, so we are defining uh, for each new company a tuple, but we are putting them into a Python list. Then this new option is to call the execute many function, and it is going to actually execute the same query multiple times for each of the list items that is included in the second parameter. So these are equivalent, which one you want to use. You can just go with them. And most of the time, if you are just uh, executing one query at a time, if you are not uh, like doing batch operations, then execute function is more than enough. If you need to insert multiple things, then you can just uh, have multiple uh, rows of the execute function. I'm going to call or execute this cell and remember we are actually not projecting we are not showing or printing any data in this cell so that's go just going to ex execute and it's not going to show any uh, success or error messages and because of that actually when you go into the application side for the project for example for the last stage of the project whenever i do some operation on the database i would like to actually get some information about what happens so in here if we were writing successfully inserted these companies etc then it would be better for uh, the user uh, now i don't get any error messages because of that i assume that the operations that i did here is actually running so if i go to next cell in this next cell what i'm doing is just to print all the existing companies in the database so if i run the cell i will see that Okay, the new companies are there. But if I try to go back to this cell and execute it again, I will get an error because the unique constraint fails for the company CID. I cannot insert the same primary keys again to the table. So in this new cell, we are going to actually get some input from the user. So let's look at the code first. So if you remember, in Python, we have the input function. So for the input function, we can write a message to display to the user. And then it is going to ask that value from the user. We can get some input from the user and we can put it into some Python variable. In this case, that's called limit in here. We are actually going to use this, to use the value of limits while printing what our, our message. So we expect the limit for the credit to exist in this variable. Then we are going to execute some query. And within that query, we are actually interested in the ID, name, surname, and credit of the users who have credit larger than or equal to the given value. So we expect some value from the user. So these two users are one user is the user that's using our code. The second user is the table user. We receive uh, the input from the person and then we retrieve data from the table. So now if I run this cell, you will see that it's asking for a limit for the credit. So I'm able to, for example, write some value here. And whenever I hit the enter key, uh, it is showing the users that have at least 700 credits. And I can run this cell multiple times. Uh, with different values. For example, uh, if I say larger than 10 credits, then I get most of the users here. But if I write some high number, then it's going to be only for a limited number of users. Uh, one problem with such usage is, for example, in here, maybe user writes nothing and uh, our SQL code will be affected by it. The user might write some letters in there and then uh, it is actually uh, executing the query, showing the results, but no result returns uh, when we write like a uh, uh, credit larger than some text in there. So most of the time, it is actually a good idea to check for correctness. Uh, so we will have some more examples of it. But for example, if we expect a number, 
we can check if it is a number or not. If we expect a text, for example, uh, maybe we need some certain length of text, etc. We can check it using Python code. So uh, that's actually got nothing to do with the uh, uh, SQL site. But when we are receiving some input from the Python code, we should uh, either make uh, some checks or, uh, for example, whenever the information we got from the user is in the wrong format, we can ask for it again. Or maybe we say, OK, we wrote wrong information, we are just closing, etc. Uh, but if you pass the wrong thing to the SQL site, to the database, uh, then we don't expect uh, like uh, like a correct uh, return from that. So for example, let's try to print uh, the users that are born in between two dates. So we would like to get two dates from the user this time. So the first part is the same. We just connect to the existing database. And you might realize that in these cells, we are actually not committing our changes because we are not making changes to the database. So a select query does not make any changes to the database. Because of that, I don't need to commit the changes after it. So there is actually no change when I run an, a, a select uh, statement. So in here as well, we are actually not committing anything. We are actually not changing anything. So we are going to get two uh, inputs from the user. These will be the starting date and the ending date. But uh, the the data we retrieve from the user is in text format. So whatever user writes there, it's actually a text. And we need to, uh, to pass them as date, for example. We need to, oh, OK, OK. So in here uh, as well, we uh, want it to be in the correct format. We are going to actually show how to like uh, get current dates but not yet. We are just retrieving some input from the user and we are saying, okay, write the date, but in this format. So the format should be correct for this cell to succeed. We are going to execute the query and for this query, we are actually uh, passing two question marks. So our condition is for date of birth to be larger than or equal to the first question mark. And at the same time, it should be less than and equal to the second question mark. And those question marks will be replaced with the date limits that we are passing. And if you check the date limits are uh, or date limits parameter is a tuple. The first one is the starting date and the second one is the ending date for that. So if I execute this query now, it asks for the starting date. So it should be in the correct format. The second one asking for the ending date. So let me write some other date, for example, in here. And then uh, it is displaying the users that are born in between those two dates. Any questions or problems about this? So this is actually very similar to this other example. We just get some parameter from the user. Another example, sometimes we may be interested in, for example, today. What is the date today? Instead of getting it from the user, this time we will get it from the system. And to do that, there are like actually several different ways of doing it with the Python code. One example usage is using the date time uh, library. Uh, so from date time library, we can retrieve today's date but today's date is actually an object. So we need to convert it to a string, right? In uh, Python, there is the date object, but in SQL, we need it in some strict format and it should be uh, in a text format, right, as well. So because of these single quotations, I know that this is a string, this is a text and with a format in it. So for this date object, we are going to actually convert it to a string with the following format. So these are saying that, OK, first put the year, then dash, then put the month, dash, and then put the day, day of today. So we are converting today's date into a correct time uh, or, or correct formatted string. Then we need to put it as a tuple. 
so today states this is no good right this is just a string to pass it as a parameter so actually we are here uh, we would like to insert a new user so insert into user table these values so the id is 13 name surname credits status as uh, and then we are inserting the date of birth and then the city the date of birth is going to be replaced by this parameter and that parameter has to be a tuple so to show that first let me actually comment out this line so if i just retrieve today's date and if i convert it to a string so today's date is a string for now let me try to run this query it is going to give an error so it says incorrect number of bindings supplied the current statement uses one so this there is one question mark this expects one value but you gave 10 values and the 10 comes from uh, we have a string right there are like actually 10 letters in it in our string so for the year plus dash characters etc it has 10 characters in it so to say that this is just one thing that i'm giving it should be given as a tuple so this line is there for that so i need to give it as a tuple so if i run it now then it inserts this new user and if i come back and list all the users in the table uh, in the user table i will see uh, marinette in the last line and this contains today's data information if you look at you can also make some calculations using the days for example let's say that i would like to find out uh, how much day difference in between two different days so sometimes we need it that's why we gave the python code for that as well so for this there are again different ways of doing it we are going to use the date time library and the time delta so in here what we are doing we get today's date okay this is the same thing that we did we printed today's date we are going to calculate a different date and for that different date we want 50 days of difference so what was the day uh, if you go 50 days earlier so that's like the question that we have here so we uh, just use the time delta function we say we are giving days here there are like other options as well for example hours etc uh, we are saying okay define a 50 days of difference this is going to be a date object and we are actually uh, decreasing today's dates by this amount to find that other date other date is again in uh, in a, as a date object we can just uh, print that object here so now let's give a 10 minutes break and then we will continue if you have any questions etc you can ask otherwise let's give a 10 minutes break
Any questions or problems before we start? So for homework two, actually, uh, your grades and feedback are available on Moodle. And for Taha, actually, unfortunately, we won't be able to accept your homework because like uh, it is uh, late and it is after when we uh, uploaded the solutions. So I, I talked with Semrawaja actually for that. So I, I was waiting to enter the grades to the stars. So because of that, unfortunately, we won't be able to accept your homework. Um, let's actually now continue with this lab and at the end we can like have some maybe uh, time for for uh, uh, some general questions for SQL etc so in this last cell what we did was to find another date that is 50 days before today's date so that's uh, one way of doing this. We can also talk about difference in terms of uh, days or weeks, years, etc. For those kind of queries as well, uh, we have some example usage here. So this has nothing to do with SQLite, right? This is just some uh, Python code. But sometimes in the projects people need that and because of that we have some examples of it as well uh, in, in just one way of doing it. We define two date time objects. So for a date time object the order is again the same, uh, year, month and then day. Uh, we construct these objects and we can uh, get the difference in between two uh, days. And then we can print the difference in terms of days for example here. So this is just printing, but we can put it in the correct format. Uh, and this is actually days of difference. So if we need to, s most of the time, we just need to like put it into some part of the user interface. We may need to print the result, etc. We are actually most of the time not using this as uh, a parameter in our SQL uh, string or, or SQL uh, execution. So sometimes we need to generate random data as well. So we have some code for generating a random date. Uh, with this, uh, there is like, uh, for some months, we have different limits for days. And because of that, like to make it guaranteed, uh, we put the higher limit of day as 27. But like if you are careful, you can also get uh, the random dates from the whole range. So if I run this query, so I see today's dates and 50 days before it was this day. And between these two input dates, there is actually this much days of difference. And this is a random date. So uh, each time I run this cell, I'm going to see a different random date. And in here, for example, if the uh, limits were wrong, it is not possible to construct a date time object. So if I run it like this, if I pass uh, for the month parameter uh, an uh, invalid number, then it's going to give uh, an error. So while constructing random dates, just be careful about uh, such things. So uh, let's look at some error messages that we can get. So for example, uh, the table name should be an existing table. So in here, if we uh, have a typo instead of user, if we write use, then this is some problem that we retrieve from SQL lit library. So it is giving an operational error. There is no such table called use. So most of the time for SQL related errors, there are different error messages. Sometimes they are more useful for example, in this case, we get uh, the exact thing, right? There is no table called use. We cannot use that because of that. For example, we can get the attribute name wrong. So if I try to execute this query, uh, my attribute name should be correct, but it is saying no such column named name me uh, in this case. So for example, for conflicting inserts, so I'm trying to insert a new company there is already a company with CID1. I cannot 
add another company with CID1 because uh, this CID is the primary key of this table and it should be unique. The error message says unique constraint failed for company.cid for the CID attribute of the company table it should be unique but you are giving some uh, value that's that's going to cause it to be non-unique so one other thing we might be trying to insert uh, wrong values right for a company we have CID name of the company and the monthly payments if we are giving uh, like uh, less than the required amount of attributes so I have to give three things to create a new company but I'm giving two things the error message is going to say table company has three columns but you are supplying two values so you have to supply three values so that's the error message for that or even when you give like more than two so if I'm writing here for example four different or five different values then this is going to complain that uh, you are this time giving five values but it has to be exactly uh, three and uh, or three columns or three attributes so sometimes for some of the attributes we have not null constraints right and you have to give some value for those attributes if you are trying to insert null values for them so this time I'm supplying three things but one of them is null company name is null but the company name has the not null constraint and because of that if I run this cell in the output it will say not null constraint failed so the company name is it cannot be null it has the not null constraint and uh, within the SQL you might have some SQL syntax errors so if you just look at the SQL code here within the double quotations we forgot to put the closing parentheses and like because it's inside the Python code it might look correct but actually it is not uh, in such cases it is going to say that incomplete input so the execute function for the execute function you are giving some SQL query but it is incomplete because uh, why the last parentheses you forgot to put that or for example if I'm not giving any values but I'm writing values star again it's saying incomplete so insert into something but it's incomplete sometimes we can have some syntax error for the Python code so in this case the SQL the string that I'm giving is correct but I forgot to put the closing parentheses for the execute function this time I'm going to get syntax error but this is for the Python right this has nothing to do with my SQL query for the connection uh, commits uh, uh, so this actually like considers this one to be connected with this one because like I guess we are not finishing or uh, because uh, just it is the error is just before this line we cannot execute this statement so some other error remember to replace the question marks we have to give a tuple even if it is just one value so in this case we would like to insert into the company table and the ID of the company the CID of the company is given as a parameter so most likely we perhaps we are going to get some for example for the CID we are going to get some input from the user uh, like please write CID and the user is going to type the CID and we would like to pass this parameter to our SQL code so why we are not just writing directly the values because we do not have the values yet uh, we define the structure here and most of the time we would like to retrieve the values from the user for example from the keyboard or maybe in the later labs we are going to see how to use some user interface elements to choose the values from an existing set of items etc uh, so let me just revert it back so this 50 is actually going to be most likely a parameter coming from the user but even it like that even it's like that uh, whenever we run it it has to be in the correct type and the correct type for the second parameter is a tuple remember when we write a string here so if it was a string uh, it was complaining that 
so actually sorry uh, I I wrote it wrong so if it is the string so let me run it it was complaining that what you give has like more than enough values so it expects one value but I gave two because the string that I gave has f f two characters for example if I write hello there I'm actually giving five characters etc but if it is just a string with five this time it works it says the unique constraint failed for CID because there is already a company with CID 5 the CID of a new company should be like higher than uh, 14 15 15 so enough not 15 15 etc so let's say 30 is a possible company ID CID but I'm not able to give it uh, as a string so if it's a string it actually works because the string is also stored as a tuple but if I would like to give a two-digit number then I have to write it as a tuple so it expects a tuple like in, in, in short it just expects a tuple but when you give a string it is also in some sort of tuple format but it is not going to like work as you uh, expect so we have to give it as a tuple so uh, now it succeeds it commits but we are not printing anything but if I try to put it again it's going to this time uh, uh, say that the unique constraint failed for CID so most of the time our program is not going to just execute some query and then close so most of the time we are actually in some application right the application is running unless we uh, choose the close button etc so in uh, our applications as well we expect similar thing so in this code let me actually run it let's look at it what it does so we have a menu of items here and we can enter our choice for this so for example if I choose one it is for showing all users so it's going to show the users in our list and it's going to print the menu again and we have uh, the option to choose any of them so we can do the same thing again we can uh, show the companies as well or we can uh, show the users with credit greater than a limit so if I choose three then it's going to ask for this time the limit for the credit so let's write some number here and then it is going to print out users that has credit larger than 800, uh, 800 for example in this time uh, so let me uh, write a different limit it's going to uh, show those users if I choose some wrong number it's going to say that okay the choices should be in the given range and if I choose 4 for example it's going to say goodbye and uh, close running the code or, or, or the execution will stop so most of the time we are going to use such functionality and if we look at the code we actually have a while loop and for the while loop our choice starts from 0 and unless the choice is equal to 4 which was the exit option there unless the choice is 4 we first print the menu we list the items there then we ask for the choice of the user anything that I get with the input function is a text so I retrieve text from user but if I'm going to uh, use it as an integer I'm going to use this int function to convert it into an integer so I retrieve the user's input I put it as an integer and then I'm checking whether it is equal to 1, 2 or 3 so if it is equal to 1 then I'm selecting from the user table printing the information and then we are finished but the while loop does not finish we get the next input or the choice of the user etc if the choice is to uh, we are printing the companies so this is the same for loop but for the SQL query that just the name of the table changes if the input is 3 we get another input so actually we use the same uh, variable for it uh, we get the credit limits and use the choice variable to store the value uh, and with this value we are actually 
executing the query but remember this choice is a value and to put it as a tuple we need to include the parentheses and the comma in this position if it was like a tuple of two values three values etc it will be like a list of items but since it's just one value we just convert it into a tuple and that tuple the value is going to replace the question mark and when you give multiple values there is going to be multiple question marks and in order each of the question marks will be replaced by the values of those tuple items if the choice was four we just print the goodbye message for any other choice we are saying okay the choices should be in this defined range so any uh, choice number you write there it should be in that range because uh, we have like equivalency for each of these items if the value of the choice is 4 then since this is like choice is not equal to 4 part then we are going to get out of this loop and we are going to commit and close the connection maybe just one like uh, small thing about using the same uh, variable for the limit of the credit so if I run it uh, if the first choice is 3 and for the credit limit if, if I write 4 here it's going to print the users the choice is 4 here uh, okay we are not actually showing the goodbye message we get out of that one we print the menu actually I thought the choice should be 4 but oh okay uh, it's not a number so in here we get it as a string and we just use it as a string so it it did not convert into a python integer because of that it's not equal to 4 although it is 4 it's a string that is 4 so I, I told that whenever I wrote as the credit limits 4 it will exit but it is not actually exiting uh, because like if I stop this running let me uh, create a new cell here if I write uh, for example uh, the choice here so let's print the choice the last choice that I wrote is 4 but if I look at uh, this choice is actually a string it's uh, not an integer for Python but when we pass it uh, to the SQL code uh, since we do not include those additional co quotation marks it actually it is treated as an integer directly so uh, so far we just print the whole row right we get some entries they are actually stored as tuples we print them as tuples so for each of these users we are printing the rows directly we can access individual elements of a row and for example let me actually first run this code so one row of data so the first user it is displaying the whole thing the count of attributes so there are seven things here right so let me go to the code what we are doing we are actually executing this query but this time let's say I would like to get just one row of data so so far if you look at it here when I execute a query it is returning a set of results and I'm using the in keywords and with the row attribute or with the row variable I'm iterating over this list of results and for each of them what I'm going to do is just printing the whole row but sometimes instead of showing everything we can just get one value out of the result set to do that we execute the query so this is the same execution right cursor dot execute select everything from the user but this line does not print anything instead with the same cursor if we use the fetch one function it is going to retrieve just one item from that result set and in here actually while showing one row we are printing r the result of fetch one function and for this r if you look at the length 
it's actually seven. The user has seven attributes, seven columns. And because of that, when we project everything from the user, it's a tuple with seven elements in it. If you would like to retrieve uh, some index value, for example, the value of index two in this row tuple, we just use the square brackets and we get the uh, value of index two. For example, if I show the output, so for this uh, row, the index two is Ramirez. So index zero, one, and two, uh, it contains the name of the user. Why we are doing this? Because most of the time, uh, we would like to do some operations on the individual attributes. So even if I project only the credit, for example, if I would like to operate on that credit, it should not be in the tuple form. I need to do the indexing. So in the index three, there is the credit number of this user. I get index two, uh, oh, sorry, index three. Uh, since this is credit column, it contains actually numbers. Therefore, when I retrieve that value, I can directly multiply it with two. So in here, there is actually no need to convert it into an integer because it's already an integer. In, in the table, it is defined as an integer. We are storing integer values there. Uh, so I just have uh, some, some variable, I uh, multiply it with two and we print the result here. And whenever we use the fetch one function again, we will this time get the second item. So we first use the execute function. It executes the query. It actually contains several rows in it. And with the fetch one function, we are fetching one result. So with each call of fetch one, we are retrieving one result and the result set uh, gets smaller and smaller. So we get the first result. And now the second uh, result is actually the first result. And because whenever we fetch one result, we are actually removing it from the result set. But this is not removing it from any of the tables. It's actually getting it from the result set that we uh, acquire with the execute function. So in here, uh, we write the uh, user's name and uh, the year or date of birth of that user and with the fetch one function again we are showing the uh, name and the date of birth of this other user so the format is the same we are printing the exact same thing but since the fetch one will return different results the names and dates will change so let me actually show the results for that one so twice the credit is this one and like for the second and third users, these are the values. So we know that with queries, we can inspect data, but sometimes, for example, let's say we would like to use the Python code to make or do some more complicated operations on the data. We can retrieve some uh, information about our data with Python code as well. So in this example, what we are doing, we are actually trying to calculate the average credit. To do that, we have the query right we can like project the average of credit from the user table so that's very basic query uh, and it doesn't put much work or or much load on the database actually so most of the time there are like different users sitting on their computers and the database in, in is in some server so through some network that we are connecting to that database whenever we run some query that server computer is actually doing the work so the server computer retrieves some data does, does some operations and sends us the data to, or the results but if the operations are too heavy on the computer on the server computer sometimes we might prefer to do it do the operation on the user side so in this case the server is going to actually uh, send the result set and the operation will happen in the application that's sitting in my computer, for example. So that's one example for this one. This is actually doing a very simple operation. So for simple operations, we are going to just use the queries. But if this was a very complicated operation, it might be like uh, more meaningful to do it on the user's computer. But what we are doing, let's look at it. So we are defining some list for the usernames. 
sometimes we need to like retrieve the data uh, and put it in some other format. So for that one, we are going to use the list of usernames. We store some total variable for the total credits. We also store uh, the user count. So for each of them, actually, we can have different queries, right? We can find the number of users with uh, a select count from user query. But this time we are actually counting them from the result set that we retrieve from this query. And that query is actually getting the name and credit from the user table. So for each of these values, what we are doing, we append the name of the user to the usernames list. So usernames, this, is, this was the empty list. We use the append function and we give the first index or, or index zero of this tuple. So we are giving the name, putting the name of the user to the usernames list. We increment the total, which was initially zero, by the amount of credits of this user. And for each user that we see, we increment the user count by one. So after this loop finishes, the total will be the sum of credits of each user. So since we do not have any constraint for the user, it's going to be for all the users. Then at the end, we are uh, calculating the average as total divided by user count, and we are displaying this message. So we, there are this many users, and the total of credits is this value, and the average is this value. So since these are integers, we need to convert them to string to include, it in, 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 to include them in our string. And most of the time, if you are doing some calculations, some floating point kind of calculations, for example, for average, we are doing that, uh, it might require some formatting. So this is actually one way of doing formatting for floating point numbers. So we give a style and this style is as a string and it's in curly brackets. In here, we are saying for the decimal digits there can be any number of digits but after the dot for this uh, floating part we are going to just display three digits so that's what we are saying with this formatting or with the style and we are using this dot format function and we are passing this average uh, variable so we just do this to display three to display three decimals after the point other than that, usernames is a list of users now. And most of the time, for example, with the application, let's say I have an application that deals with users, and I'm going to retrieve the list of users once, and if I store it on my computer while the application is running, then I can operate on this, uh, or, or I can display those values without needing to retrieve it from the database again. So. That's one uh, example uh, for uh, showing that. So let me actually go to the output. So there was 21 users. This is the total number of credits. When we calculate the average directly, this is the result that we get. But when we apply the formatting, it is in a better shape. And we can display the usernames. So these are all the different users. And since uh, we append them, in order so we get some users a result set from uh, the database and we are with the same order appending them to the user names list because of that uh, these are actually appearing in the order that's stored in the user table and for example in here if I create another cell for this list user names for now, I do not have the connection to the database, right? So in this position, I close my connection, but still I can retrieve the usernames. Uh, for example, if I'm interested in some uh, users, maybe the users in index two to five, so I can list those, us those users. I can uh, get the username in this seventh item. I can uh, show how many users I store in this list, etc. So uh, I do not have the connection to the database, but I can work with the data that I retrieved. 
but uh, like from some time to time I need to like run this code again to get the latest users from the database. If multiple people are operating on the same database, maybe uh, some other people will del delete delete some of the users. Uh, there will be some new users inserted, etc. So this user names is some local information that I have uh, without needing to connect to the database again. For some time, I can use this information, but from time to time, I need to get the uh, original values from the database. And in this example, we are doing some search uh, for the users. So let me actually run it first. So please enter the substring you are looking for in username or surname. So within the username on user surname we are looking for some substring for example if I write n there so these are the users that have letter n in their name or surname and I can choose one of these users to show more information about for example let's say for Marta 3 if I write 3 there it's going to show more information about Marta it's going to show the whole attributes or, or for, for, for the user table is going to display the uh, whole entry and it's going to also find the partner companies of this user and show them and if I run it again for example if I write LO so these contain LO for example Gloria Floyd and for Louis I have letters LO in them and in here uh, again it does the same thing but this is an example to showcase that uh, I can get some input from the user and I may append some special characters to that text so remember uh, we have uh, the keyword like and if I'm using the keyword like I can use the percentage sign mean to meaning any number of characters can replace this one or I can use the underscore symbol meaning that one character has to replace this symbol I include other than that for example uh, we can uh, have additional uh, text that is going to match exactly for example for the Gloria etc thing OL this was the substring that I wrote here LO sorry and for LO to search this partial text I'm going to append percentage signs before and after this text so I need to actually write this right to be able to write that in this format what I need to do I retrieve the information from the user so I get the input from the user which is a text and I append the percentage sign characters before and after this input that I get from the user. Then I store it as the partial text. And for my subquery, or oh, sorry, for my query, for my SQL query, this is the thing that I'm getting. I select ID, name, and surname from the user table, where name is like question mark or surname is like question mark. So these question marks will be replaced by partial text. So I have to give the second parameter of the execute function as a tuple. And my tuple is formed by the combination of the same variable. So if the first one is partial text, the second one is partial text. But I'm giving it as a tuple to replace uh, these question marks. But then I'm appending those users to a list. Why? Because I would like to actually refer to those users without needing to show their ID. If you look at it here, so if you look at the results, whenever I get the results for the users, they are indexed starting from 1. So for Gloria, this 1 is not the user ID. This is just the order number that I'm displaying them. This is actually the order they appear in my user list so I have a users list I'm appending those results into the users list but since there is some order of append here while printing the users so if the length is larger than zero if I found some users uh, I start from index one 
for user in users so users is the list that contains all my users what I'm doing I'm printing that user so I'm uh, displaying the index number then the username and then the user surname and I'm incrementing the index by one so if I look at the output so index is one Gloria Evans increment index for item number two Floyd Ward etc and while choosing one of these users I access them through this order number so this is going to be something that you are going to need for the project so most of the time instead of uh, like uh, calling the users by their primary keys you can have some uh, order numbers that are assigned to each of the uh, entries that you are going to manage and if you look for Lewis if you print the whole information the user ID is actually 12 so we are actually not showing the user ID directly we are storing it some uh, part of our application whenever we need that we can like uh, get that information and work on that so we are getting some value from uh, the user the choice and then we are showing more information about this user and if the user did not choose within the range for example let me run it again so e uh, so these are the results that we get but if i write 20 here it's going to say out of range so the thing that i write there should be within this order items range for example if i choose 10 Rex Green, but there are no partner companies for this user. So let's look at here. If it is within the correct range, then what we are doing, we are actually accessing the user's ID because to retrieve this user's companies, for example, we need the user ID. And where to get this user ID? So the user is going to choose one of these items. We are storing them in a list that starts from index zero but the user is going to choose among some number that is going to start one from one so that's why we decrease the chosen value by one so in here for example number one means that index zero number two means that in index one etc because of that to convert this order number into the index value we just decrement decrease it by one and from that user if you remember we were appending to the users list what we are appending uh, it was the first ID then name and surname so the ID is actually included in index 0 so from the user in this index position I retrieve the ID and this is my user ID then I can uh, call some or, or execute some other SQL code to retrieve additional information originally for the all users we just got their ID name and surname for example we did not get the city or date of birth of every user in the application while listing the users but then whenever we need to get more information uh, with the primary key of a table we can call a query right in this query we are selecting everything from the user table and for the users that have ID equal to this user ID we give it as a tuple and for those users we expect only one user actually right this is the primary key it can be equal to only one value at the same time we cannot have duplicate values for the primary key because of that we use the fetch one function we can also do it in the other way as well we print the row and then for the partner companies this time we are using the loop, loop version we uh, make the join operation between partner of and company type tables right we get the CID company name and monthly payment from the partner of and company tables and remember uh, with SQL if you include more than one table if you would like to do the join operation you have to specify the join condition otherwise it is just doing a Cartesian product 
So for joining partner of and company tables, we need the company ID to be equal to CID. And we only want this information for a specific user. That's why we say the user ID should be equal to this question mark that's going to be replaced with the user ID that we give. And there is like the uh, out of range and no such user messages. For example, if I run this query and for the substring that I'm looking for, if I write some uh, random uh, values, it is going to say that okay, I'm not able to retrieve any information for this substring. And that's actually it. Are there any questions or problems about these? If not, I'm going to like uh, touch upon some uh, like very in a summary way for like preparation to midterm maybe. So in the labs we have seen some applications, right? We have seen some software. Actually in the exam you are responsible for the theoretic part only. So what you see in the class you are only responsible for that and for for example using sql let studio using drawio or any part of the python is not going to be included in any of the exams but this is uh, the things that we talk about is actually more focused on the project but we are actually using the theory from the class so uh, among those theory like uh, let's remember some important concepts i guess so for a table uh, we always need some primary key so that's one information for example whenever you are drawing some er diagram etc you have to have primary keys for all the entity sets except for some uh, special conditions for relationships we are not explicitly showing the uh, primary keys right for uh, childs of a parent if you have the is a relationship uh, for the child of that entity set you are not showing the primary keys of uh, the child's explicitly uh, so actually let me uh, get to some uh, slides that are related so for entity sets we can have more one or more attributes that are the primary key uh, we need solid underlines for them with the is a relationship for childs we are not showing the primary keys explicitly they are actually within the diagram this is a relationship says that it is going to inherit this primary key plus all the attributes of the parents so we do not need to show them explicitly and uh, like we can have some hierarchy right uh, user manager and workers can be users and for the workers we have we can have like subcategories of researchers and technicians and most of the time whenever we do some uh, is a uh, relationship we expect some sort of difference in between the children so for example the relation capabilities could be different or there could be some additional attributes so by relational capabilities I mean that for example maybe for the advanced users they are in some relationship R1 and for beginner users or beginner students they are in some relationship R2 etc so if they are connected to different relationships uh, then the, it is like enough uh, evidence to make an easy relationship otherwise if they have no such difference and if this is just talking about the type of the attribute then maybe instead of using an is a relationship we can just we may include it as just one attribute for example the level of the student instead of having separate tables for beginner intermediate and advanced students we can have perhaps a, an, a level attribute for the students so that's something we decide based on the differences of uh, these types of users so the relationships are defined in between different entity sets and for a relationship uh, the primary keys are uh, implied by the diagram so for this relationship whatever I'm connected to I need to store foreign keys for them and then based on the cardinality of the relationship uh, I decide the primary keys uh, so 
how to decide the cardinality uh, you just look at how many of one side is matched with the entries on the other side and to think about it uh, everything is going to be a table so for product it's a table category is a table for in I'm going to have some other table and you might write uh, some example entries for that table for example this is a many-to-many -many relationship meaning that a product can be matched with multiple categories and one category can be matched with multiple products and because of that if you consider such table then the primary key of this table so when we are talking about the primary key we are actually trying to find a unique row if I just look at the category ID for example so for one I have duplicate values if the category is I category ID is one I'm not able to find a unique row there for product IDs as well so in this data it is not like that but uh, it is possible to have the same product number here as well and if that's the condition I'm not able to find a unique row if I just look at the product number as well I need to know the combination of product number plus category ID to locate an uh, an individual row uh, for this data so that's actually a many-to-many -many relationship and in a many-to-many -many relationship the primary key is the combination of all the foreign keys so when we look at the different kinds of cardinality uh, one important thing in our ER diagram style if there is an arrow it's always next to the relationship so next to the diamond shape it is never next to the entity set so it is always appearing next to the diamond shape and for many to many we have lines on both sides for one to one we have arrow shapes on both sides meaning that one product can match with only one category and one category can only match with one product so for one to one relationships they are actually not for categorization they are mostly uh, used for uh, having some like let's say users have passports one user can have one passport and for one passport that can be only one user so in such scenarios we have the one-to-one -one relationships and with one-to-many relationships from one side we can uh, have multiple occurrences in the table but we from the other side we have just one occurrence and this could be confusing uh, about which side to put the arrow so this is like some figure to help you about that so let's say owner has dogs for one dog let's say there can be only one owner but for a, for an owner there can be many dogs and the leashes of the dogs kind of similar to the arrow sign that appears on the dog side uh, next to the has relationship so you can remember it from here if you want and there is also the total participation and with total participation if one side's line is bold then that means this entity set has to for, sorry uh, let me say it like this uh, entries in this entity set has to appear in the relationship as well so whenever I have some product it has to participate in this in relationship for category in the first figure I do not have such constraint if I have both lines on both sides then I'm saying that okay for each category to exist if there is a category then it should participate in this relationship as well and we can mix and match these cardinality and participation constraints for example we can say uh, for a category there can be multiple products but for a product there is exactly one category why because for a product because of the one to many relationship there can be at most one category and because of the total participation for every product there should be some category so the total participation is saying that there are uh, more than zero categories and the one to many relationship is saying that there is uh, like at most one category and the combination of these two is going to be there is exactly one category for each product so be careful about such uh, keywords so in the description for an ER diagram there will be some hints that are giving you some information about what to do so uh, at most at least exactly one uh, many etc multiple so you need to be careful about such usage 
there is the ternary relationships if uh, multiple more than two attribute uh, more than two entities are uh, in some relationship uh, it's also possible right uh, but in the most common case we see uh, them as two or three so that's why the ternary relationship has a special name but it's the exact the same thing but for the cardinality you may need to like uh, think it uh, for a second there uh, and while you are considering the cardinality in between two of the entities so for example if i close one of the entities then it is like a simple uh, relationship between class and course so you can uh, like when you are reading you can uh, hide one of these entities and think it as a simple relationship for example it's a one to many between class and course uh, for a class there can be many courses but for a course there can be only one class uh, this side as well for a teacher there can be multiple courses but for a course there is only one teacher but between class and teacher uh, for a class there can be multiple teachers and for a teacher there can be multiple classes etc the aggregate relationship was the case when we define a relationship on top of an existing one. So in this case, teachers are teaching courses, but sometimes we would like to assign classrooms as well. Let's say most of the classes are online, but sometimes they are taught in real physical classrooms. And because of that, we need to assign those uh, physical classrooms. But we would like to assign the classrooms to the teaching activity itself not for the teacher so this class is not for the teacher only it is not for the course as well maybe there are some courses that are not taught this semester for example and because of that we would like to only assign a class to the teaching activity we are actually connecting this aggregate relationship to the relationship teaches but we are not showing it in the ER diagram like that we are showing it with the aggregate relationship uh, we have the dashed rectangle around just one relationship and this means that in is actually connected to the relationship teaches so uh, we also had the weak entities right with weak entities uh, weak entities cannot be identified uh, using their attributes only for example medical reports of students and in this case uh, so in in most of the real life scenarios for example for a medical report there is going to be a unique id and like in the original or realistic version of a medical report it is not going to be a weak entity set but for the sake of this example we said that okay medical reports are identified by only description and date so for a medical report there is no other information there is only the date and description we also set one more condition we are saying one student can have at most one medical report on the same date that's again not realistic but for the sake of example we uh, had this condition then to identify a medical report we need to know the id of the student that this medical report belongs to so for a student we can have many medical reports so one to many uh, kind of relationship and this is actually for weak entity sets we have uh, this appearance most of the time uh, weak entities are one to many relationships with total participation on the weak side so for a medical report uh, this medical report can belong to multiple uh, uh, the, sorry uh, one medical report can belong to only one student but for a student there can be many medical reports and to identify the many medical reports of one student we use the date information as well the date is called a partial key why because it's used as the primary key for a medical report together with the uh, primary key of the attached table so we are uh, connected to the student table which is not a weak entity it's a strong entity we need the primary key of that strong entity plus the partial key of this weak entity to be able to identify uh, identify one entry in this weak entry entity again we can have some uh, relationships that are connected to the same entity set multiple times in this case they are mostly connected with different roles and we can write the uh, name of the role on top of the line that connects 
some common mistakes uh, so we do not connect attributes together we do not use directed or bold arrows for uh, connecting attributes to entity sets uh, for relationships if there is an arrow it's always next to the diamond shape and for aggregate relationships so this is actually very important most of the time people do mistakes about them for the dash rectangle it should contain just one relationship not multiple relationships if there are multiple relationships within the dash rectangle then i don't know which relationship a row is connected to so a row can be connected to the relationship own or a row can be connected to the relationship called have which one i'm not sure because the dash rectangle should contain only one relationship plus the entity sets that are connected to that relationship so for the partial key of the weak relationship weak entity uh, we need the dashed underline not the solid underline that's also important and uh, for the weak entity sets uh, like uh, if there is the weak entity it should have the weak relationship so you cannot have like one of them appearing bold so if the relationship is bold then for the weak entity the entity set should also use bold line and this is the other version as well and we cannot have like a long chain of weak entities because weak entities has to depend on strong entities so in this case for example student has medical report we say but to identify a medical report we have to know the information about student as well just with the medical report we cannot identify a unique row and because of that we cannot attach an address using the medical report as a strong entity because medical report itself is a weak entity and another weak entity cannot depend on top of it so these were like uh, some information from the ER diagrams and for uh, relational schema actually uh, like this is more about the project but we are using the relational schema so we are uh, like giving the relational schema and then you need to like derive some information from it we might give the relational schema and ask for you the ER diagram etc or you might get the, the information about the attributes the foreign keys and primary keys from the relational schema and in here like uh, some of the important concepts are about the cardinality so the cardinality is kind of determined by uh, the choice of primary keys in relationships so only for relationships uh, you have to look at the cardinality while deciding the primary keys of such tables and one other thing is for aggregate relationships for aggregate relationships while writing the relational schema important thing is that this aggregate relationship is referring to the primary key of the relationship so AR is not referring to A and B separately AR is referring to R so that's one important thing because of that foreign key KX is referring to the KX in table R in this aggregate relationship so with ternary relationships etc they are actually uh, really uh, similar cases and then we also had uh, like uh, let me get this one we also had some SQL queries in lab 3 and I'm got just going to mention a couple of important points about this So we have some special format of writing SQL queries and if it is readable it's better. We have the comparing uh, signs and like not equal to symbol as well for comparing numbers. We can mix and match conditions using AND or OR operations. And then uh, we can give a set of items and use the IN keyword there is the uh, is null and is not null constraints as well we can use relational uh, re sorry regular expressions so these are actually called, called regular expressions when you use any of these symbols 
So using the keyword like, uh, you can use these two special symbols, meaning that any number of any characters replace the percentage sign and with the dash symbol, one character could replace those dash symbols. Uh, we can use some aggregate functions, but with aggregate functions, uh, be careful, we can only project them, right? We can use it directly in select portion. Uh, but if we need to, for example, find the user who gets the maximum credit, this was wrong, right? I cannot use a function as a var statement. So that's actually very important uh, in the homework as well. Some people did mistakes about it. If you need to use the result of a function, then you have to use a subquery. And with that subquery, I retrieve the maximum credits first. And then for the matching credits, I'm uh, getting some other results. So it can be replaced with any of the uh, functions. I can project multiple functions, etc. One other important thing was the group by keywords. We can group uh, attributes according to some or let me say, uh, we can group uh, entries according to some attributes, but we need to be careful because uh, there is some constraint and this constraint is not followed by SQL lets, but it is followed by most of the SQL languages. Uh, when using group by, the things that we group by, so the things that we project can only be a subset of the things that we group by plus the functions. So this is uh, for the exam, you need to be careful about that, right? Uh, in SQL lit, uh, it allows you to uh, project attributes that are outside this attribute list for the group by statements. So for example, uh, for SQL lit, if I group by user ID, I can project name, it allows that. But in the exam, because of this uh, constriction for other SQL variants, uh, we need to only project the things that we group by plus the functions. Uh, so Ta says, but function does not have to use attributes to write. Yes. Uh, so for these functions, for, so if I'm grouping by UID, I can project UID, but then I can use sum of credit, average of credit. The functions does not have to use the attributes that you group by. And most of the time, actually, we are uh, using functions on top of the attributes that we do not use group by. So UID, if I'm grouping according to UID, then in a group, the UID of the entries will be same. For example, if I'm grouping according to the city name, then within a group, I already know that the city name is going to be same. Uh, because of that, I mostly use the functions for other attributes. So, uh, we can project uh, the results of functions, so that was one thing that we know. Uh, if I include more than one table, it makes the Cartesian product, but if I want to join those tables, I need to specify the join conditions. And because of that, uh, like for each uh, two tables, to make the join operation in between them, I need one additional uh, var condition. So to match a user with the partner of table, I need a join. For matching partner of with company, I need another join. So we can define subqueries as result sets. So this is a subquery. It's going to return a set of results. And for that set of results, we can give a name. In this case, we give the name groups to that set of results. And then we can actually use it like a table. So we are saying from the company table and from this query, let's run that query. It's going to return us a set of results and let's give the name groups to that set of results. Then we can use it as a table. We can make join with them. We can have additional conditions, etc. And in this case, we are actually uh, counting some information and giving a name to that attribute as well. So user count is some column name within the subquery. And we are putting this column name or, or that uh, attribute to the outside query. We are projecting the information about that. 
uh, with group by statements we can use the having conditions so one important thing about having it is going to be applied for the groups it is not for the individual attributes and because of that with having we are going to mostly use functions but just using the function is not enough in the homework some people did mistakes about them if you just write having count then this doesn't mean anything you have to compare it with something it can be like having count larger than equal to some value etc so we need to make some statement that can be either true or false so just writing having count does not mean does not mean anything so we have to like make some comparisons etc and in such queries for example i can say having count equal to the result of some subquery as well so i can still use subqueries when i use uh, the having function but to be able to use the having keyword i need to use the group by keywords so without group by there cannot be having so i need to use the group by as well for having and using the var conditions i'm not using functions right so the distinction for var and having statements next to var i do not write functions within a subquery there can be functions so this is different but just on the same level as var i do not have any functions appearing but for having statements this time i'm not actually working on individual attributes i'm go going to call some functions on top of the attributes it can be for example sum of credit etc and th this having statements are going to work on using the groups for the group by we also have updates delete and insertion queries so insert queries are very simple right we just give the values that we would like to insert so can we use subqueries with having like we use them with var yes yes you can use subqueries for example uh, for this one so for this one for example instead of writing this value it can be a subquery uh, it can be like for the select uh, count from user where city is e equal to some city for example so this is going to be uh, also possible maybe we are looking at uh, groups with counts larger than the user count that live in Ankara for example that can be some uh, possible thing to do any other questions or problems with update and delete queries we can have like the same conditions but updates delete and insert queries are working on just one table right with select we can have multiple tables but with update we just work on one table but what we are doing with like uh, these these numbers here we can have sub queries again so for example to calculate the credit number we can use some sub query and one example was this one we were updating the users by the amount of total monthly payment of the partner comp companies of this user so in that case we actually used multiple tables but those multiple tables occur in the subquery so in the subquery we can do uh, like anything we retrieve the results then we are relating that result while updating our user table any other questions or problems about anything So then that's it for this lab. Good luck on your exam tomorrow. So uh, next week we are going to this time start working on user interfaces in Python. And for the project, uh, there is the deadline for this night. You are going to like upload the relational schema. It's actually very simple. And 
then uh, for the other stage of the project implementation stage one you are going to actually create the database using uh, SQL Lit Studio it is going to be again an easy stage of, uh, of the project it will be very similar to lab 2 uh, the second half of lab 2 remember in the lab 2 we first wrote the relational schema from the ER diagram and then looking at this relational schema we created the SQL Lit database and for the implementation stage one we actually ask for you to create the SQL Lit database for your uh, project and then you are going to like insert five uh, somehow meaningful random entries for each of the tables so we just use, want you to put some example data so that you can use in the later stages of the project so that's it for today uh, see you later